author event, Brian Tao Wara. I have a lot of different books to read to, um, from t um, for you tonight here, and I think the um, way that we're going to um, probably do it um, then is that in exploring my own journey as a writer, um, then with um, so much of my um, literary journey beginning in Ann Arbor, Michigan itself, um, Let's see, we're going to take probably about an hour to look through kind of um, the um, earlier pieces as well as the um, pieces that I'm most well known for, which are a little bit more science fictional. Then. And I found that a lot of people um, immediately um, ask me you know, afterwards then questions like, well, Brian, it's like, you know, um, you're coming into us from the secret war for Laos, from the aftermath of the Vietnam War, growing up in... Um, Michigan during the 1980s, during um, so many key you know, moments in um, the Asian American journey, such as the Vincent Chin case and so on. And it's like, you know, um, where does the science fiction come in? Or, you know, or it's like, this is something that I didn't know that you could even do, you know, science fiction combined with poetry. And I'm going, really? Well, that, that's a very interesting question because when you look at it, you go all the way back to the very roots of poetry and literature. You look at the Odyssey, you look at the Iliad, you look at Beowulf and all these great classics, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven and the Jabberwocky. You know, and, and, you know, and the question is, is well, why wouldn't you know, people from a refugee background you know, also be able to add to that? Why wouldn't we be pushing the limits of where our experiences can go? But again, Let's try a few pieces here and, and get us warmed up with that. Burning Eden, one branch at a time. My father, a skull before the wars were over, never saw my mother's flight in terror as our humbled kingdom fell to flame and shell. My mother was stripped to income on the bureaucrats a number for the raw statistics of jungle errors collated into cold ledgers marked classified, secret. My feet, dangling in the Mississippi, have forgotten what the mud invention feels like between your toes, while my hands hold foreign leaves and I whisper, maple, oak. Weeping willow, as if saying their names aloud, will rebuild my home. Pasafalan, foreign words. En route to our cafe rendezvous on University Avenue, debating sushi, pho, or nachos, everything bagels or decadent croissant. Famished literary ninjas crammed in a car, or were we Roman gun ho samurai? Pondering our ink filled avatars, a verbose madam from Phnom Penh who loves to sing Domo Arigato, Mr. Roboto, and every stanza of Bohemian Rhapsody Galileo, Galileo, at karaoke reminds me Sub ID will always be. A foreign word. Aloha, America, a V I sing. This next poem comes from um, the work that I did during the 2012 London Summer Games, as a matter of fact. And it explains a lot of my own po po um, political philosophy, um, called On a Stairway in Juan Prabhan. Step as you will through life, a thousand ways, a thousand places. Carry a home in your heart, or spend years seeking the door where your soul will always smile. Do you ease the way for others, or just yourself? Do you climb great mountains just to leave them unchanged? One day, the heights of holy Fusi will lay as soft valleys, and we only memories, but our children's children, will they too have a reason to smile, like those dreaming strangers who finished their stairs for us? 
Let's see. Let's go with another piece of mine, then. This is a bit of a longer cycle, then, that came out of my work with the refugee communities in uh, Minneapolis. This is a piece that is called Five Fragments. Only seven people walked away from Camp S-21 in Cambodia. My critics asked me to find the beautiful words to make this more than a statement. Chase the rhythms and meter and propel this into true poetry. Aesthetics mustn't die in literature. Don't starve language with your emaciated lyric. Don't keep back the flourishes that will set these words apart, or anger and memories will only become passing wind. And the tattered spines of your book about this camp will be thrown in the garbage without even the pump of a Berlin book burning. Surely, a 14,000 would appreciate that, who have no eyes, no voice, no hands to applaud and cheer anymore. They want me to splash in Pol Pot's rivers to find the true tears from mere fallen rain. But if you ask my neighbors across the hall, you will find a particular indifference whether I succeed or not. Part two. When the portraits came in black and white, stained and torn without a trace of artistic intent, they were mounted upon a plain white wall in the Weissman Museum, across from a stout statue of a squatting Buddha and his curious smile, recovered from the mud after the Khmer Rouge went running. There were no names, only stenciled numbers that had meant nothing the next day in the camp. How many years have they been touring, these haunted faces, hoping someone would recognize them long enough to restore names to them. If the words, it's tragic, cross your lips, the odds increase horrifically that you will give a matter no further thought within hours. In the other gallery, Dion's solemn cabinet of curiosities, custom assembled for the university, was amusing the, the spectators with all the charm of a Renaissance scholar. All the usual divisions were there. Underworld, sea, and air. A terrestrial realm, humankind, a library and archive, the allegory of vision, the allegory of sound and time, the allegory of history. Gaze upon the sodomites descent into hell, a specimen of algae, a freeze-dried cow lung, a large hand-painted fan, a set of black Chinese binding shoes, earthen forceps from the late 1800s whose modern counterparts have barely changed, a Napoleonic teapot, in the words of Ewell Brenner, etc., etc., etc. And the day I went, a young woman in green muttered to her boyfriend, ah, what is all this junk in the basement? It's not art, and it doesn't belong here. Moments later, he replied thoughtfully, I hope they validate parking. Part three. When the B-52 bombers pummeled Nyak Lon by accident, over 100 Khmer died without cause, with no more ceremony than a shrill whistle and a burst of flame and shrapnel from a mile high. Ambassador Swank came to assuage the grief of those who survived with a grand gesture of $100 bills, American. A woman I know from a village near Angkor Wat tries to escape the nightmares of the camps today by filling her house with tropical trees and flowers from her homeland she remembered as a little girl. What for? In 1990, 
over an after-school match of Trivial Pursuit. My teacher in Celine asked, what is the name of a country where Pol Pot instituted year zero, killing thousands of his countrymen? Cambodia, I answered with certainty, confident and familiar. No, he replied. No, well, what the hell is it then? A card, says Confucia. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Ten years later, I can't believe I argued over that point as I stare at crude wooden tables piled with skulls near Phnom Penh. And finally, part five. In two years, I don't believe I've said more than a dozen words to my Khmer neighbors in the apartment below me. That's just the way it is. The other day, I walked past the grandmother, trying to talk to her mon counterpart across the hall. Broken English, hesitant and uncertain, had become the bridge as each stood in their doorway, fumbling towards something resembling an ordinary conversation. Gardening and grandchildren seemed to be the subject. And I still don't know what to make of it all. Now that's a pretty heavy piece here, so let me try a bit of a, a, um, a lighter one then, because this one came from a, a um, true story then, as I was um, leaving college and um, trying to figure out you know, all the great classic questions of literature. You know, who am I? Where am I from? What, it's, like, you know, what, it's like, what is this journey? And that took me um, into, of all places, Missoula, Montana. And this was a um, poem that seemed to catch fire a little bit, um, where, entitled, A Spirit Catches You and You Get Body Slammed. I came to Missoula to ask him about the inner workings of Uanen, of shamanism, to understand the symbolic significance of split horns and spirit horses who trace their noble smoky path to turns of an auspicious moon above ancient Chin. My tape recorder at the ready, my fountain pen freshly filled with indigo ink, my ears, my eyes, my heart, all were humbly waiting for the wise shaman's words to impart to the next generation of youths who sought this fading voice. He spoke, and my interpreter said, Who's your favorite wrestler? I wasn't certain I'd heard properly. Grandpa wants to know who your favorite wrestler is. And he spoke back to the shaman in Hmong. Rising with a stately elder's grace, the shaman confidently said, Randy, macho man savage, and struck a macho pose. Smiling, he then offered me a cup of hot coffee and I was too stunned to say anything more for the rest of the afternoon. Years later, I still have dreams of their shining hero, Shi Yi, smashing writhing demons into blue turnbuckles, watching next to a hundred smiling shaman in the audience. <laughs> That's just the way it works. Everyone always makes it seem like, um, you know, as you do these anthropological journeys, then that you're just going to get these deep, deep, profound conversations. And you, you do get them. But there are also those lighter moments that, uh, that almost always get thrown out. But The last war poem. I tell you, this is the last word for this war, this little side war we were the center of. There is no justice from poetry. Any veteran can tell you that. They want their land, their lives, their livestock back. Grenade fishing in the aftermath of a battle for Fu Fa Tea has lost its novelty to the man with a bullet fragment rattling in his body, slowly tearing him apart. Right, they tell me. Right what? We lost. We were forgotten. 
we are ghosts. We are victims of fat tigers and foreign policy. There is no Valhalla, only memories of specter gunships. There is no Elysium, only pleas for asylum. This jungle was filthy. There was shit. There was blood. There were refugees who to this day cannot explain why they were the enemy when the war came. Their sons fought. Their brothers died. Their uncles, maimed, were hauled, screaming into the shadow of a plane of jars. Right, they tell me, so people won't forget, so someone will know. Lift the broken bodies with my words, bring them out and say, we did not die in vain. For every bullet hole, let there be a word to stand as a monument. For every lost limb, let there be a sonnet to stitch the truth back together. For every eye gone blind, let there be something to take its place. Something, anything. How can you not have words for the war of whispers? And how can you not shout now that the whispering is done? And I swear, each time I break this promise, that the next time will be the last word I write about this damn war. Oh, this was one of the earlier poems that I'd done from this journey, called Surprises in America. It took me by surprise that Hitler was a vegetarian. Apparently, Rudolf Hess too. I remember reading them about, it, about them as a boy. I remember the outrage when someone asked us to forgive them because the two would pet their dogs before night. It took me by surprise that Soldier of Fortune magazine offered a reward for Idi Amin paid in gold, dead or alive. It was a lot of money. But what does it say when mercenaries set bounties on tyrants' heads? It took me by surprise that we weren't always the good guys. What couldn't we buy in the land of the free? Why couldn't we go where we weren't welcome? It struck me by surprise that many people didn't believe I was an American when I had lived here all of my life, except for that two-day trip to Toronto. They had told me instead that my mother had died. I don't think I would have been as surprised. Here's a poem that actually came out of uh, my years in Ann Arbor called Wisdom. And it goes, it's like, no, and as an early poem, it goes in a lot of different directions, but bear with me, I think you'll enjoy this one. Right. Wisdom. The Greeks say wisdom begins with a face in the mirror that says, I do not know. Sun Tzu needed a lovely girl's head to show that knowing yourself and knowing your foe was enough to win a war best won without a single drop of blood upon these rosy roads filled with beauty. Confucius, with his aging pupils, had enough to scribble out in the time he had. It is only the wisest and the very stupidest who cannot change. A lousy man from Honan in his laid back way says, between good and evil, how much difference? On the internet, you can find a copy of the I Ching that will give you free readings at the click of a button if you're too lazy to toss the coins and the arrow, with all the reliability of a tarot deck stripped of a minor arcana. Exacting physicists say that everything that rises must converge, and every action carries an opposite reaction, equal and pure. The Zen monks in the mountains think they can get away with the, I don't know, a fushiki, and nothing more than an empty fist. If they aren't careful, it will cost all of them their lives. The Chinese say that wisdom begins when you begin calling things by their proper names. 
an Amway rep who shall remain anonymous, says, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And it's best to go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. And such wisdom is as old as the pyramids, depending on whom you talk to. In some cultures, it's rude to talk to someone if you have nothing to say. And after a time, you might find that saying nothing and saying something amount to the same thing. A monk man was quoted obscurely, a world is only as large as a man is willing to walk. Exhausted and weary, the GIs in Kuwait say, wheels are better than heels. Mortal combat, between its savage round contends, there is no knowledge that is not power, and it's not worth losing your head or your heart for a quarter. From the lightless grave, Lord Acton wags his ink-stained fingers powerlessly in disapproval about abuse in absolutes. And thundering Mr. Elliot through an April haze murmured incomprehensibly with a lost Brahmin's lullaby, Data, Deyadavam, Damyata, while a shrieking young boy from the back streets can only see a wasted mile of indigo ink. This will never be his mantra. A dog whispers conspiratorially. If you cannot kill it, or eat it, play with it, or sleep with it, or even crap on it, leave it alone. But then again, they say dreaming dogs lie, don't they? Aldous Huxley wishes that in 60 years he could have produced a message more profound than try to treat people a little more nicely. <laughs> While Beatles proclaim, all you need is love. And after all of this, a young mother looks at me and asks, why bother looking at all if that's the best that you can give? And peering down into that cavernous cradle and her trusting baby's lively smile, how can I come empty-handed? Japanism, Taoism. In the kitchen, I'm watching the world through Lao eyes, making a meal on a foreman grill with American hands. Or is it the other way around? Are we leafing through a stray copy of a Lao literary magazine found by chance in a stray campus lounge? Grow in in the shadow of maples and pine cones when the actor was in office, there were nearly no books available about the kingdom of a million elephants. Like many people, a tattered issue of National Geographic was my closest glimpse of a land I left nearly 30 years ago as a child of six months. And like all those impressionable French in Paris, after Perry's thunderous stunt in the Yokohama docks, we, we're busy watching the toys and diodes pouring in from the Ginza. Shogun warriors and roar in atomic kaiju, smashing Tokyo's matchstick streets, occupied the children, while Detroit and Zenith squirmed at their fallen market share, wailing about MacArthur and our post-war treaties. A word, sub-ID, was unheard of as we struggled just to say sayonara, as a sign of our culture, as sincere as those shrubs we fobbed off as bonsai on the unsuspecting in the South. Back then, papayas were as rare as pad thai. It was sushi that was all the rage, with wasabi horseradish that would set your nostrils on fire, gasping for water. I was trained to revere razor-sharp katanas in Zen, stoic as a bowl of udon. The heroes of my father in the ruins of Lanshan and Lan Praban were barely footnotes ground into mud in the aftermath of the wars no one wanted to remember. And now my skeletal editors are calling on me with their chattering skulls. Where are your words for Fa Num and Chao Anu, or the fallen honored at the Patusai? In all of this time, surely one word about Vinchan 
will not kill you or your friends. And it's hard to answer, sitting down to eat in July. Write what you know, my teachers admonish. Sip in my soda. I turn the pages of a weathered book of Van Gogh prints inspired by Hokusai and the ukiyo-e and Sai. My flag is as obsolete as the word Indochine. And I realize today that I am older than my father lived to be. It's been too long since I last saw an elephant or the monstrous river catfish. They tell me somberly, a freshwater Irrawaddy dolphin will be extinct before the next time I come by. And I couldn't sketch any of them worth a damn if I tried. A part of me wants to smack the next person who says, I won't be Lao if I don't write about Laos. Do cops stop being cops when they're arguing about the White House and crooked pardons? Do robbers become priests if they talk about faith? Riviere saw the peaks of Hiroshika's Fujiyama among Eiffel's iron girders, and he still died French and human, poor thing. Just right, young man, I hear my father whisper. Just right, and we'll sort it all out later. And with a last bite, I return to making my own book with a defiant smile. There was a time where part of this journey for me as a Lao American writer has been getting the Lao American voice and the Lao American perspective um, into the world of arts and letters. Um, to put it into perspective about my work, um, when I you know, put together the Lao American Writers Summit with my colleagues in 2010, there were less than 40 books in our own words and our own terms in the space of 40 years in the United States. And so you can imagine you know, our surprise when I found out that I had written many of them. <laughs> and so um, some people were asking about that, um, about what does it mean to search for your identity, to search for um, your heart, you know, and, and um, I think part of that was that Ann Arbor, um, in particular, thanks to um, the punk rock scene at the time, thanks to um, just a counterculture, then was so fundamental to this experience, you know, then that it gave me that strength to um, go up against so many publishers, mainstream, um, Asian American, um, you name it, you know, and it's like no, yeah. Sure, we got a lot of rejections um, during that process, but it didn't stop me. It was just kind of like, um, yeah, well, if it voice comes to us, I'll just do it myself, and I did it a lot <laughs> then. But this poem comes from the early 2000s, then, called Anthology. Because I will not write of white rice or shades of yellow, they tell me there is no place for me. Without a Mekong river of tears trailing down a mountain of black hair and stale sushi, I will not be Asian enough to fit into this volume of Eastern voices for Western coffee houses. You know good if you no talk like cereal box tops about transitions and the old country, or grandma and her wise and fortune cookie wisdom amid a comic bevy of also tragic, hard working, heart breaking restaurateurs and cunning launderers wandering a crooked Chinatown street. They will tell you, you may have been an English major, but you'd best keep these nonsense thoughts private and give the audience what they want for God's sake. Don't rock the boat, people. A woman walked up to me recently and asked, what is the name for my yellow hue? I said, color me pissed. People often ask me, what was it like going to college in Ohio, Brian? It's like, you know, it's like, and I've gone, well, let me say this, is that I don't regret it, but it was definitely a very different experience. This was um, a poem that came almost um, immediately after that called Midwestern Conversations. Midwestern Conversations. You're the whitest guy I know, Nate tells me over a backyard barbecue at the end of high school. And it's supposed to be a compliment. You speak English even better than some of the students who were born here, a teacher tells me after hours. And it's true. 
I'm pulling you over, sir, because frankly, you look like one of the bad guys. A cop tells me, his hand on a holstered Glock in Ohio, and you've got an awful lot of cash on you. But I'm just getting my rent for my landlady who doesn't trust my checks. The other day, a young Yonsei sent me a poem entitled, I Can Be White, and my heart can't give it an iota of serious consideration, although it's entirely possible I'm just projecting. Well, this one's good for the weather. This one came across um, years ago during the, um, the big storms. Granted, it's like here in the Midwest, there are all big storms, but this one was called An Archaeology of Snow Forts. There's not much left to be said, but some well-washed stone hasn't heard before. History is composed of broken walls and bad neighbors. Just ask these chips from Berlin, the Parthenon, and Café, or these cool magma hands of Pompeii, dark and gray. If you listen carefully in the right place on University Avenue, you will learn there is a minor wall near the Yalu River, dancing on the hills of China for the moon. Who knows exactly what I mean in every tongue worth mention. She's moonlighting as a curved garden serpent coiling around old Leokoan, a suspicious one with his astute eye, crooning with a sly wink. Come, come, touch true history and how the moon must laugh when she spies the tiniest hill in Minnetonka, where the small hands of the earth have erected a magnificent white wall, a snowy miniature marginal fortress raised some scant hours before, already melting into a hungry, roiling river who is not yet finished eating Louisiana for brunch. That's the funny thing about poems. I think sometimes we look at it and we ask ourselves, you know, what are we writing and what are we creating? What, what lasts and what doesn't? And um, I remember when I read this one a couple of years back and um, none of the children knew in the audience who Godzilla was. And I never felt so old in my life <laughs> then, but now it's like, you know, now I can bring this one back out because a new Godzilla film is coming out this year, so I have at least a 50-50 chance in the fall of reading this poem and having someone get it. But, a big G. We don't say his name aloud in serious poetry. We close our eyes and say he doesn't exist. I am a modern Eastern Peter with a mouth of denials while the roosters crow at the rising sun. Right next to a certain master of Jeet Kune Do, he stood like a giant Tory gate between my heart and the American flag. How many people were surprised when my words moved in time with my lips? Even today, they still believe my buildings can't stand the test of time, crumbling at the first sign of trouble like a pasty French defense only a swarthy legion of strangers can vindicate. But well, the old boy's got stamina. He's neck and neck with James Bond, trampling for police academies and Shakespeare plays. Now, why should I reject this reliable radioactive lug just to be taken seriously by some stiff academe with erectile dysfunction and a bad toupee? And in learning to love the reptile, perhaps we can learn to love ourselves, atomic halitosis and all. And that is obviously our hint that we're moving into the more science fictional aspects of our reading tonight. Are you all with me on this so far? All right, great. Part of the challenge with all of this is again that um, when I talk with many of my students is the question of, you know, oh gee Brian, no one knows that mythology from Southeast Asia. You know, then, and I'm going, and that's precisely why we have to try and, you know, and bring it forward, you know, then, is that, you know, 
we can't be afraid to um, share that with other parts of our community simply because there was a time people didn't know what a vampire was. They didn't know what a werewolf was. They didn't know what a hopping vampire was. Um, then. And so we just take that risk. Sometimes it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall um, there and, um, and you never know what you get. So this was the opening poem for my book, The Monster, which you can get out there, which kind of explores that. Idle fears. In the shade of a Kali Vatlao, I debate with Ajahn Anan what the secret Rakshasha Sutra must really look like. In Lao, we call them Nyak, or Yuk, or Yak. It depends. When they're hungry, what do names matter? I ask. Does a zombie have Buddha nature? He informs me, a mindless craving for brains complicates things. He suspects Frankenstein's monster is closer to Nirvana, but don't quote him on that. An American werewolf in Ron Praban would stand no chance against a real Lao were tiger. Both should try to observe the five precepts of a Buddha as best they can. If he were going to make a special vat for robots, he might name it Vat Lao Robo Buddha Ram. But they would surely have to learn to get beyond artificial work binary world views. You aren't going to turn this into a poem, are you? That's nothing to be afraid of, I assure him. Usually. Let's see, I just got finished having a conversation with someone about um, a work of H.P. Lovecraft then, and one of you know, the strange ways that influenced my work. And, so, um, and in the course of that conversation, it came up with, well, you know, um, he was a terribly racist writer um, then. And I go, I know. That's like, and he wouldn't have liked loud people if he ran into them. I go, I know. That's like, but then again, you know what? If, you know, if we were going to approach literature that way, I would have to um, excise all, almost everyone from Chaucheron down um, to Hemingway and, and so on. It's like, you know, we just, we have a literature we have, and um, as writers, we respond to it. One of the poems that came out of that is a poem called The Deep Ones. From the sea we come. From the sea we come, our mouths, the ends of the world, the salt of the earth unwelcome at the tables and chairs of explorers who expect commodity and pliant territory, kingdoms, not wisdom, blood, not heaven's children. We grow with uncertain immortality at the edge not made for man, bending curving, humming cosmic, awake and alien. Our mass, a dark and foaming mask, a bed of enigma to certain eyes. One with the moon, one with the stars, one with the ash that whispers history in the same breath as myth and gods whose great backs yawn before us. As we change with a growing tongue, growling amid the dreamlands, we built one blade, one leaf, one golden wall at a time. And then, surprisingly enough, one of the um, poems that, um, that took a life on its own, um, and one of my younger students actually um, ran with it and um, created a play called Kung Fu Zombies versus Cannibals to explore the Lao American diaspora. Because one of the reasons we do um, so much of this work is that in working with many of our veterans and our elders who are traumatized by um, the conflicts, it's hard to get them to talk about what happened in the camps, what happened during the secret war, during the bombing, and so on. But when we framed it through the lens of science fiction, of fantasy, and horror, whether it's something like The Walking Dead or Z Nation or something else um, like Blade Runner, and all of a sudden it became a lot easier um, to have those conversations. Um, that, oh yeah, um, you see the picture of a zombies running through um, 
the camps, then all of a sudden the elders would have these conversations like, oh yeah, yeah, well that's not how it was like back in our camp, it was like this. And then we started to get the stories we really wanted to hear. So this was part of that process. But this one always gets us here called Zambuda. But Zambuda utters OM, not brains. It's not attached to the body is not attached to the mind. Decay is one aspect of a cycle of birth, life, death, rebirth, redeath. Never perfumes or gilds the self. Comes back for you, perhaps right behind you. Keep going, he says in his own way. Observes a walk-in meditation, does not hurry or drive cars or trucks, or tanks, or gunships, or warplanes. Will not touch money or liquor. Is beyond the vices of lust and greed. Focused. Not one possession of a past matters. Old names are useless. Accepts every moment with equanimity. No fear, no pain, no anger, no jealousy. Burn him. Cut him, shoot him, flee him, free him. It is the same. The old riddle still applies. Meeting the Buddha on the road, you can say nothing to him. You cannot remain silent. What do you do? You will destroy him to be comfortable. Some will follow his path, becoming one with him, laughing at the dancing bones of Zen and the lessons of an uncertain universe. Now, this one is interesting because it took us a real long time to start getting a robotics program in Laos and even in many parts of our um, community in the aftermath of the conflicts. But this is called a Robo Sutra. Like most Lao ventures, it began with amusing a laugh around the year of a rooster, 2600, a jest, a modern now epic Faram Faram. It took a pack of jokers working overtime in the world's largest badek factory in the Lao Town quarter of North Minneapolis, automating the stinky process for grandmas and pretty ladies squeamish about fermenting fish and putrid spice. Their task was no Hadron Collider or Visionary Hubble, nor a Cray or a Retro Difference Engine. But in the age of STEM and T-Punk, service learning and nanopreneurs, they had hearts a tin woodsman would envy. A key problem in robotics, they found, in coding, free laws declared universal standards. In an e-nutshell, true robots could not harm humans directly or stand idly by while obeying all and protecting themselves in any other hazardous situations. Lao, keen on their karma, conversant in the Dharma, punched holes in the notion. Beyond the questions of cyborg bioethics, saving clones, and 99.9% .9 mostly humans, the vaunted laws presumed everybody came for only one fragile incarnation and your struggles in your next lives were inconsequential. <laughs> How narrow. So they set about resolving this problem. There were, of course, trials and errors. But new laws could drive a robot crazy, guessing how not to harm humans across their lifetimes, wondering what happens if people return a fish, a gecko, a snake, or some ignorant oath of a swordsman cursed with, nah, immortality, there can be only one. But they all grew, trying to grapple with such uncertainties. There were corporations who despised it. Hippie AI has no place in defense industries who rely on being offensive. This was as obvious as a drone above an unmarked building near playgrounds. Little Laobots running around trying only to make people happy, banned from murder and injury. What absurdity, leaving dreadful responsibilities to mere humans. But in times of peace, 
most agreed. Lao artificial intelligence wasn't too bad run in a city compared to many mayors of prior centuries. But you have to like the elevator more long they play constantly. This one won uh, the award from Strange Horizons magazine. When, um, and as a little bit of a back text, we um, now have a um, love for this particular epic that we refer to as the Ramakian, um, when, or it's a variation or a localized version of the Ramayana, this um, big Hindu epic, and some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but it essentially involves um, a huge, um, big-nosed giant um, kidnaps um, the beautiful wife of the prince and takes him back to um, his far distant island that no one has ever seen before. And um, you know, the prince, um, doing the kind of things the princes do, um, immediately um, gathers all of his friends and includes um, a group of beings known in Hinduism as the Vanara, in Lao as the Vanan, um, who were basically these monkey beast creatures then. And we're having a debate even now among our scholars as we do this research of, well, is this kind of a um, hint of the first bioweapons then? Because the Hindu gods apparently create these beings specifically to, um, it's like, um, to defeat um, these nefarious demon giants. And it's a, it's a very interesting um, question indeed, because, you know, like, most of them are familiar to the community as, um, as monkey men, but if you could have um, pig men, you could have um, half bear, half boar. It's like, you know, all these wild combinations, Ben. But that led us to um, the question then of um, projecting that into the far distant future of um, all metal Hanuman. And also the question of how we use our proxy armies, which, oh yeah, you know, we don't ever use proxy armies anymore. <laughs> but all metal Hanuman. They fling us at empires when the cosmos needs to die. Engineered by the best AI minds of Nulan Chan, in the boot tubes we sin. They'll never let us in. They'll never let us in. They'll never let us in to holy him upon. Not quite monkey and not quite man. In the future, true havoc needs more than a mere dog of war. Lautonium shell around a simian soul, dropping through the sky, ready to die, armed to the bone with free, strong hearts, tailored for express mayhem and murder of your pristine social orders. We close our eyes with enough time to dream. Six hard minutes through the hot atmosphere, visions of fabled Dao Venon, our own planet, our own Caesar, our own books of law and liberty. Ape shall never kill ape. No spill blood. The joys of Ahimsa. A distant world keeping all of your promises made to us for 400 centuries. It's a temptation to read you some sequences from the Dream Highway of Ms. Manavonsa, which is this sprawling epic I included in here. When, um, when people ask me about how do you come up with you know, books, I often say that the challenge for me has been that I don't like to create books which are um, similar to the others. So uh, with Demonstra, it was a, a um, question of what do these Lao epic poems look like then? Because um, on the one hand, um, it drove me crazy during um, the um, recent admission of a new category of epic um, book awards in, the, in one of the major science fiction um, categories, Ben, because I'm going, well, actually, you know, and it's like, yeah, you've got this huge word count for um, what qualifies as an epic, you know, ben, like these phone books that if you drop it on a poor child, it's going to crush them or something like that. And, like, and I get that. I get that we want these whole huge Game of Thrones um, sized epics, but you know, it's like the actual Greek epics were like 4,000 lines. It's like, you know, um, Beowulf isn't much more than 400 lines when you go to it. So it's not as huge as that, but anyway, that's a, that's a small aside here. Let's go with a 
like something with oh yeah this is a new personal one you it's like sorry again you're going to be a bit of a guinea pig for tonight ben this is called no such p a p is the loud term for spirit or ghost or any number of beings that we classify with extraordinary powers mother meh asks why i write of new ghosts for our old country, one warm night in Ceres, California. Haven't we enough from the last seven centuries to keep us busy? Hospitality, I reply, sipping a hot Ovaltine. Hospitality for pee? Don't be silly, she says, smacking my head, returning to cook for the coming company. I go back to my notebooks, amassed over a decade, musings and mentions of Suspect spirits, spooks, and ambiguous entities we classify as P. In our majority, we burn our dead with some ceremony. But it is not wholly impossible to imagine a leathery Lao zombie, loathsome and lonely, estranged from home. Do we dub it a zombie or merely a P zom? A final nomenclature will be strictly academic amid actual panic. You'll see. Stout Auntie Twee insists her son, callow face buried in the pale of another mindless video game, is the type to truly herald the end of our meek world. She laughs, a loud bright macaw, but it is not even half as cathartic as she hoped. It bears an irate pikaupun, pissed at murderous noodle sellers. It stands to reason bears at least one snarly before Although what her precise issue is, no one seems to know. Uncle Som somberly suggests avoiding her, no matter how tempting the steaming soup or all of her exotic condiments of lament. Never follow her into a dark kitchen. That's just asking for it, he says sourly, adding, absolutely never ever request seconds. Regrettably, I have some doubts regarding my dear nephew Nin's suggestion of a shocking Pikachu. <sighs> Not to be confused with a Pikachu, all anguished nocturnal beauty and floating melancholy viscera, etc. I asked him, do you want to get us sued? His petition for the awful PBJ, who reeks like a gooey kid sandwich, oozing, smacking ghostly lips caked with stale peanuts and jelly, won't make it into the final book, most likely. Still, there is a P for almost everything, everyone. Sometimes a new P comes into being with a novel invention, such as the P Talasop, haunting those who violate telephones between shrill screams of white noise and static. Their dire warnings to, uh, to reform are always cut off at the critical moment. Even you hanging as karma approaches. My sister wrote, contemplates P Bombies, impolitic as it is, and B-52 memories. We could talk all day of such legacies, the foreign oars of war, wind, and fire, dug in for four decades, bristling with secrecy. But at least we got a visit from Hillary. My long lost brother is back this year. We ponder missing moments between us and chuckle at the unlikely P. Nakavi, a ghost of poets once beloved as the eyes of our wise city, who said something enduring that no one listened to. Ouch. Did I write that? Okay. Let's see. Hmm. Well, since I don't have too many of my classmates in the room here, I can actually read this one. Ah, Celine, 1991. I don't write about that last year often. There were days I honestly thought our class would remain close forever for some reason, naive as a Midwestern hornet in spring. I could tell you of teen mothers before that June. There was a young artist from Vietnam. He made a silver seahorse for our yearbook full of dreams before his suicide in his uncle's garage, full of American carbon monoxide. But that's dark. A teacher of mine convinced me you should read Don Quixote by Cervantes thrice in your life, once as a young man, once as an adult, once as an elder. It was a Sphinxian proposition short of an impossible dream. During a friendly game of Trivial Pursuit, a pretty girl's father casually mentioned 
It's wonderful she's a friend of mine, and that I'm smart enough to know it could never go anywhere. I almost became one of Uncle Sam's misguided children, except for my bad hearing, transformed into a poet instead. A croissant was Tina Turner's simply the best. My peers gave me the award for most talkative, tied with a girl named Marika I haven't heard from in years. The National Endowment of the Arts just gave its announcement for this year's winners of the, um, of the NEA Fellowships in Poetry. This is the um, poem of mine that you know, is up at their website and when, I, you know, when I became the first Lao American poet um, to hold that distinction. You know, wow, 10 years ago, when is that time ago? What? Gop chai for nothing, Falan. A bomb popped in his face while he was digging a fire pit for his family squatting on the old mercenary camp in Shenquan province, so notorious for its UXO, unexploded ordnance. They live there for the American plumbing, our host said flatly, watching volleyball games by the airstrip. This was holy routine. The ruined grounds were frozen. Explosives, dormant blooms below, can be mistaken for ice and rock easily. And he screamed the whole time as we loaded him into the back of our rickety plane to Vinchon that Lao aviation picked up from the Russians when everyone thought a Cold War was going somewhere. The California girl on holiday was aghast and found it quite unscenic. What a pall on her search for highs. In Vatin Pen, a monk named Suk confided discreetly, we really hate hippies. Uh, one thing Ann Arbor taught me was never to be afraid of the political poems here. So this is one called Interesting Times. A John pulled me aside one saffron morning after the chanting with a secret he wanted to share, like a war in the tropics. If Americans visit Laos, they'll never be president. Just ask Hubert Humphrey, Hillary Clinton, Ross Perot, David Duke, and John Kerry. My memory is fuzzy, but I also suspect John McCain. Obama was already president when he went, so that doesn't count, but we can watch to see what legacy remains. It won't necessarily be emails or Benghazi, Swift boats or an obscure faux pas skipping flyover country like the Motor City. But the ghosts of Lan Chan have a habit of doing in even your most elaborate political machinations. That's a weird way to dissuade tourists and sexpats. We do what we can against corruption and extinction, all in skies and blind ambition. He asked me to explain Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men a tattered copy someone left behind a lifetime ago. We might as well have been east of Eden. To two last poems. Wall. Today, a poet died because he lost all of his questions. Somewhere in France, a tire exploded, delaying a young girl's tour. She's burst tears, caving around a fistful of euros as she senses Lost moments, just over the next hill, floating a red balloon. There, she imagines Joan of Arc, a bicycle thief, and Jacques Cousteau, a street that's been there for centuries. Elsewhere, a little boy becomes an artist as he sniffs his first jar of tempera handed out by a young teacher from Hokkaido, unaware of the 72 tubes of oil paint he will use in his entire lifetime. Today, I'm waving at a crow in Como Park, as if my hands were semaphore flags signaling, hello, like a transient gray alien, wondering what a bird has to do to become reincarnated as a writer the next time around. Yesterday, a girl I knew changed her hair color, insisting it made a difference, handed me an antique birdcage she found in the street. Its curved door broken off, a rusty smile 
for curious dogs who don't know what to make of it, howling in a frog town alley, devoid of poetry. In closing, what is the Southeast Asian American poem of tomorrow? It is not hip hop, despite some hopes. It is not slam. It is not even an anti-poem. It is not the form of old Europeans or the resurrected Ghazal. The author's words, I must inform you, will not even resemble or recall the old Gutzia, Kadal, or the insert blank here. Much to our parents' regrets, who pray among vats and steeples and temples for good grandchildren, lucky numbers, and doctors in the family. If our lovely readers do not grow free, we will be unreadable. If our writing is too predictable, we will lie in the ditches unsold. If our words don't speak what's in our souls and skulls, we will forget ourselves, our bodies, our shapes, our language. And the true shape of a Southeast Asian American poem of tomorrow will become an exercise in modern myth. This program was recorded on February 13th, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.